numbers are moving. Okay. Hello. Today is Wednesday, June 16th, 2004. Uh, the name of the persons being interviewed is Roger Caton, who is a veteran, and his wife Lois Caton, who is a civilian. My name is Debbie Eater, and I will be conducting the interview today. And I am with Rotary Ypsilanti. Uh, the name of the camera person is Rick Caton, sitting next to me. He is the son of Roger and Lois. And we are at 938 Sheridan Ypsilanti, Michigan and the branch of service for Roger is the Army Air Corps, and his rank was trainee. So we'll be conducting the, the interview shortly. Thanks. Roger and Lois um, were just 13 and 14 years old on Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, they um, were, were kind of just coming of age during World War II. Uh, however, on June 6, 1944, uh, Roger went off to join the war effort, uh, having enlisted in the Army Air Corps. Um, although he did not serve in combat overseas, they have a unique story to tell. And uh, uh, the, the war played a large role in their lives during the period of time when they were in high school, and also had an effect on what came later. And in fact, um, uh, they did eventually marry in 1947, and will be celebrating their 57th wedding anniversary this year. So. Uh, We'll now proceed to talk with Roger and Lois and hear what they have to say about that period of time. Hello, I'm Roger Caton, and this is my wife, Lois Caton. And uh, I'm going to tell you, we're going to tell you a little love story as well as a war story. Where uh, Lois uh, would like to start and describe just before my service time started, and she's going to tell you a few things about our our relationship. Lois? Well, it was um, September 8, 1943. It happened to be my 16th birthday, and we were at the Teen Canteen, which was an old mansion up on um, Grove uh, Street in Ypsilanti. Uh, years later, our son and daughter-in-law lived in that house, and they still live there. But it was the teen canteen, and it was a custom on somebody's birthday for all of the young men, the young teenagers, to dance with the birthday girl. So um, I was there with a date, and Roger was there with another date. Uh, we only knew each other from Sunday school at that age, stage because he was a year older, and um, although we grew up in Sunday school as little kids, we didn't date or anything. So after I danced with him, we danced so well together that I thought, oh boy, this is, this is a handsome man and he's, you know, very smooth on the dance floor and everything. So um, uh, we didn't think any more about it. I mean, he was big man on campus because he was president of the student council. He was the sports announcer. He was in the National Honor Society and he had the lead in his senior play. So I, I never thought he would look at me twice. But anyhow, um, <laughs> About a week later, I was babysitting downtown in Ypsilanti, and the phone rang, and it was, he said, this is Roger Caton. My bout fell off of my chair, and he wondered if, if we could have a date for Saturday night. So that's how we had our first date. That gives you a little preliminary to what, uh, what happened, transpired later. Here we are, uh, 57 years after our wedding, and we're ready to celebrate it in uh, July, the 57th. So uh, I won't say the ages, but you can figure out how old we'd be in 1944. <laughs> now, I, in early 1944, the recruiters came to Ypsilanti High School, and they tested the young men for Air Corps cadet uh, service. As part of this uh, program, I had to have a uh, recommendation from our, my principal, and he wrote about it in glowing terms. It was very well received by everybody. And uh, shortly after, we, then we took the, took the test for the uh, Air Corps program, the cadet program, which included a one-year college, 
and I, I found out that I passed the test. I found also that uh, Michigan Tech in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan was my destination for this, what they call the ASTRP, Army Specialized Training Reserve Program. And uh, it would give us uh, basic first-year college classes in preparation for the, the cadet training later on. Uh, at this time, I mentioned that this was the Air Corps. It was later to be known as the Air Force. And so that one might clarify it for someone. Now we received orders showing names of other Midwest cadets with a report date of June 6, 1944. It's a significant date, June 6, 1944, D-Day. Uh, Lois, did you have anything? Well, when he got his orders to report June 6, 1944, it was two weeks before his high school graduation. That meant that he was going to miss um, the senior picnic, we, he was going to miss class night, he was going to miss graduation, and worst of all, we were going to miss the prom. And so I wasn't too happy about that. But he got on the bus at 6 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. on, to go, uh, his dad and I took him to the bus station to get on that bus to go for a 23-hour drive up to Houghton. And um, so he was on his way. Now, you mentioned the 23-hour drive, and that, that was a long bus ride to Houghton, Michigan, to Michigan Tech, and uh, as I said, in the Upper Peninsula. We arrived on the morning of June 6th. This is, I, I, talk, I don't know how often I've talked about this, but very significant. The, uh, the story of the landing on Normandy was on the radio at that time, and there couldn't have been bigger news for guys just going into service, because the, we knew, we suspected, maybe this was the beginning of the end. Then it turned out to be. You remember how you first got the news, Roger? <laughs> well, we didn't. Re we didn't know until we walked into the day room of the uh, of the college. What was that like? Could you could you take that us morning, back in the morning we arrived? Mm -hmm. Could you take us back and describe the scene a little bit? What was it like when you walked in? Were people kind of talking about it, or? Was it on the radio? Were people gathered around the radio? Or, or what exactly was it like? Well, it was early in the morning, and as it happened, I think we had the day room to ourselves, pretty much. So we were talking among ourselves, if that's, that's about what, what it amounted to. It came on radio. It came, yeah, it came on radio, of course. No TV in those days. Was there a radio playing while you, while you stood and talked with your uh, uh, fellow recruits? I'm sure there was. I, I, what exactly things that they were saying, I, I couldn't tell you. Now the uh, next move, uh, exact details, I, I can't recall, but we started with our clothing issue right away, physical exams, and finally room assignments in the dormitory. It was, the place was called Douglas Houghton Hall. It still exists. And that was a long time ago, 60 years ago. We were lacking in military skills, but uh, we, we soon got into the routine. It was, it was quite, a, uh, quite an experience. It was, it, was, um, it was like a basic training. And going on to when we started our classes, we marched to classes each day, uh, took uh, a lot of phys ed, get our bodies in shape, and, uh, and took freshman subjects. In this case, it included military courses. We were at Michigan Tech through March of 1945. The next stop was Shepherd Field, Texas, for active Air Course basic training, which we took two times. Now that is extreme. They were they were marking time till our discharge, actually, which we were not a, not quite aware of, but it so be, it became clear. So you finished it once, and they started you all over again. Is that what happened? That's correct. <laughs> War was winding down at that time, and you knew that. You knew that the war was winding down. At yes, that time. I had very. <laughs> we were all very much aware of that. Mm -hmm. And was it a bus trip to Texas? Uh, no, it was a train trip. A train. Okay. 
Now we took the uh, uh, the next one of the important things that we did at Shepherd Field was we took the what they call the Stainine test to find out what what we would be qualified should we go to the cadet program, such as pilot, navigator, bombardier, and so on on an airplane. But uh, I, I, they told us uh, we passed everybody passed the test, but I you know you don't know. But I, I feel sure that we did, and uh, so. But they didn't tell us what we qualified for, <laughs> so the flyboys would never know. See. Okay. After after the summer at Shepherd Field, some of the cadets were assigned to Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. It was plain that this was to mark time until our discharge. The order said remote control turret mechanics. Could you imagine the word mechanic in our in our future. <laughs> but, but that never happened. <laughs> Now we marked time up there too. One of the one of the ways we marked time was that uh, one of the Air Corps Air, Air I, don't, I guess it was Air Corps still uh, sergeants held a class in analyzing handwriting, <laughs> which I, I've used some of that since. I found it I found it interesting, mm -hmm. but uh, we were we were lucky. We didn't have to go get shot at. So. But this is all part of the people that participated in it. So it, some did and some didn't. Roger, could we backtrack a little bit to sure when could. you were in Texas during the summer? All right. Um, do, you remember the, do you remember the day that uh, they dropped the first atomic bomb? Uh, August? What was it? I've forgotten the date. August, yeah, August of 1945. Do yeah. You, do you remember the day it happened and do you remember what it was like to hear about it? We were confined because they were having a big celebration downtown. They didn't want us down there in, in the melee. So they, they didn't let you go out and celebrate? To, no. no. Were people celebrating that the United States had dropped a big bomb? Well, that meant the, yeah, that meant the end of the war with Japan, so I guess they were. It, it's very hard to remember just exactly what, what uh, people's psyche was doing, you know. Did it make an impression on you when you when you heard about the atomic bomb being being dropped, or was it something that was so kind of new and unusual that kind of horrified by it? Mm -hmm. I saw the pictures of a, you know people with their hair burned off and everything. It was, it was pretty terrible. What but, pictures? How how did you see pictures? Was it in the paper? Had to be in the paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you remember this from when it happened, or from a while afterwards? Sixty years ago, don't ask me. It's it's hard to remember. I'm not sure. So pictures didn't come out right away. I mean, we didn't realize, as you recall, we didn't really realize what the bomb did. How devastating it really was. You know, I guess I guess that's true. Yeah. Well, shortly after that, we we got uh, the word that we were being discharged. <laughs> This is in Colorado now? This is back to Colorado? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. we were in Colorado, so we were, had to pack up our bags and get ready. And we ended, uh, finally went to Bearfield, Indiana, which uh, I can't find a soul who ever heard of. <laughs> but it was kind of small. <laughs> but uh, the thing I remember about Bearfield was the, the uh, non-coms that had these stripes and, and all up and down their sleeve, six years of service here and six years there. And, they were a little upset to think we were getting out. It was called the convenience of the government. And uh, we, we were discharged, very plain, just simply. And of course, at that time, I had my field jacket stolen on me. Oh. Nice, nice, you know, everybody likes to take something home from me. And uh, so I never had a field jacket to bring home. Well, then, I marked time till it was time to, uh, through that winter, till the spring semester at Eastern Michigan University, and then we, then we enrolled and we were there for two years. But uh, I took business courses, and, then, and I worked at my, my job 
in high school, I forgot to mention this, my, my uh, job in high school was at a clothing, men's clothing store at, called Hayward's Menswear in downtown Ypsilanti. There are no downtown clothing stores left to speak of. But uh, I went back to that, and uh, along with my schooling, and I spent the entire decade of the 50s learning the mechanics of merchandising and buying and so on. So, um, Roger, um, two years at EMU, did, did you, was that a degree then at that point? No, I didn't achieve a degree. Okay. No, but I, I had uh, a little more than two years. So we started our family and uh, okay. it was more than uh, this little head could take. <laughs> Was it the GI Bill that gave you the opportunity to go to that's, school? That's correct. Yes. Do you, you think you would have? Yeah. Year at, at yeah. Well, well, plus, year. you had that fresh. Yeah. That's so what. Well, that's what added up to almost three years. Yeah. Three years. Yeah. Uh, Stupid thing to quit school. Don't ever let a child quit school. Do you think you would have had the opportunity to go without the B, the GI Bill? Do you Probably think you so. That would have gone the, to college. Uh, the tuition was not that great. It would have been possible. Try it today, no way. <laughs> well, we spent, as I said, we spent the decade of the 50s working in the store, and about toward the end of the decade of the 50s, the owner of the store, Mr. Paul Hayward, died. And his wife, after a couple of years of running the store, decided to sell it. And so uh, my partner, a partner that I had, bought the store. And that was the that was my career, that running that store till till closing. And they all did close eventually. All the smaller street stores. I don't think there's 300 of them in the nation. I don't know. There might be. So what year did it close? Uh, 1980. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm Well, I'm, I might add something that when he went into service, we were a steady couple, and um, he, I wrote every single day a letter. We exchanged letters every single day that he was in service. And up in the attic, we have a box about that big, like a suitcase, all full of the letters that we wrote. And we have taken them out and read them a couple of different times to see, you know, what was going on there. But um, in all, we started dating in September of 1943. And then when he came home from service, I was in college and we were there together. And then I received my diamond, my engagement ring on Christmas Eve mm -hmm. of 1945. But because the Ford bomber plant was here in Ypsilanti during the war and there were thousands of people that came into Ypsilanti to live, there were no apartments or houses to rent at that time. So actually it was a year and a half later in July of 1947 when we got married. So then after we were married, we lived out, well we lived at whoever, whatever relative had a vacation. <laughs> we would live in their house for two weeks. And then eventually, because my dad was in the lumber business, um, everybody got together and built us a little house out on my dad's farm. And all of our boyfriends that had come home from service, my brothers, my uncles, and my dad, and his dad and his brother, everybody built us a little house, which we moved into in 1948. And that's in Ypsilanti? In Ypsilanti, about five miles west of town. And it was there that we had four children while we were in that little tiny house. We called it our doll house. Um, and then we moved back into town um, in 1958. And in 1960, we had our fifth child. So um, we were pretty busy. And we, did you work while you were in college? Yes, I worked, uh, well, during the war, uh, I worked at the telephone company. I was telephone operator. And um, it was the manual boards where you put a plug in, you know, and said operator, and then in these plugs. 
And when the bomber plant came and the thousands of people came into town, we were so overloaded on our phone board that we had to stand up. And we were running back and forth on these boards, you know. And then from there, I went to the um, uh, business office of the telephone company, and I was there until we were, until after we were married. And uh, then, um, all, all through the years, through the 47 years, uh, I've been a nursery school teacher. Uh, we had 14 little tots in our house here, um, besides our own five. And I was a Girl Scout leader. And uh, the kids, of course, were in Little League and uh, Cub Scouts and uh, Girl Scouts and had a Girl Scout troop, piano lessons, ballet, and all the things that young families 26 liked. years in the PTA. Yeah, 26 yeah. years in the PTA because <laughs> between our children, there were three older ones. And then five years later, number four, Randy, arrived. and then. Five years later, Robbie arrived. So that meant that we went through Little League and Cub Scouts and all those things at three different times. And like we say, we were in the PTA for 27 <laughs> years. <laughs> but it was fun. We've had a, a wonderful, a wonderful I told life. you this was a love story. <laughs> and now we will be celebrating, celebrating our 57th wedding anniversary next month in July. And so how about Rick? Um, how, where does he fall in the family? He's number three, okay. our second son. We have a daughter and four sons, and Rick was our middle child. Mm -hmm. A very wonderful little boy. <laughs> a very precocious little boy. <laughs> how about if we backtrack a little bit now and uh, go back through some of the times that you've lived through. Uh, a lot of folks who wound up uh, living through the wartime were actually growing up during the period of the Depression in the United States. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like uh, uh, growing up during that very stressful time? Well, it, it was seemed normal to me, but uh, I guess it wasn't normal to have to cut the cardboard out of the Nabisco shredded wheat box and tuck it into your shoe just so you wouldn't hit the pavement. The holes in the box, sure. And, you know, but yet we didn't feel poor. No. But the, there was an awful lot of people in that same boat. Mm -hmm. It just, you could get enough to keep it together, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Roger, can you tell us a little bit about the circumstances that led to uh, your family uh, packing up and moving to Ypsilanti from Fifield, Wisconsin. Well, it, it was never fully explained to me, but it, it just seems that my dad, who was a hunting and fishing guide at a lodge in northern Wisconsin, uh, wasn't getting enough, it must not have been getting enough clientele up there to pay a, a yearly salary. So they they uh, threw out the lines, and uh, one of the lines was to bring him to Ypsilanti, where, where aunt? his aunt, my Aunt Esther, lived with her husband, Aretas Bedell, a railroad man. I'm loading up too much stuff here all at once, I guess. But uh, they came down in a Model T Ford from Wisconsin. Three children. With three children all the furniture they could load on the car. You know, like <laughs> Beverly Hillbillies, I guess. Yeah. And when they arrived in Ypsilanti, when he was only three years old, they knocked on the door at Auntie Esther's house, and she looked at Roger, a cute little boy with big blue eyes and a little Buster Brown haircut, and he says, Annie, do you know what they did? They sold my cribby bed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Totally crushed. Mm -hmm. And in our family, we were lucky enough that my dad was at Scoville Lumber Company from the time before my mother and dad were married. And so he had a job, but everybody had a, a garden. Everybody grew their own vegetables. Um, our clothes were made out of um, old, I mean, worn out shirts and uh, sheets and things like that. In the Depression, mother made all of our clothes and they were always white because they were made out of the white shirts that dad had
great at the cost. And uh, she embroidered little um, rosebuds across the bodice of the dresses that we wore. Um, we, like Roger said, everybody was poor, but you didn't know it. You the know, kids didn't know the it. Kid, you didn't think you were because everybody was in the same boat. But we went to Sunday school and we got an allowance. Uh, we had chores to do at home, like we were just little kids, three, four, five years old. But we made our beds and um, we stood on little stools and helped to wash dishes and we got 10 cents a week allowance. Five cents went into our basket of Sunday school and then we had five pennies left over. And sometimes for a real treat, we would save the five pennies from one week and put it with the next week's and go to a movie, which was a real treat in the Depression. It might have been a Shirley Temple movie or Our Gang comedy or something like that. So that was a special treat. Roger, can you remember, uh, uh, for example, was there maybe a special Christmas that happened during the 1930s when you were growing up that you can remember anything about? Can you describe that for us if you have any special memories like that? Christmas never never amounted to, to that much, but uh, uh, usually uh, we'd have one major, <clears throat> one major item, and maybe that's a bicycle. But if there was a bike, there was nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, we always had the, uh, we always managed to have fruit, you know, oranges and, and the stocking, and it always had fruit in it. Didn't necessarily have to have any toys, but just that we had a sock, a stocking for Santa to put something in. And the candy always, cane. And the candy cane. He always came through. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your brother and sister, Roger? I know that you had an older brother and sister. What was what was it like to be the youngest? Well. Uh, <laughs> my brother was in the army. Yeah, my, well, my, yes, my brother was in the army. He was in the in the armored section of the military, and he was overseas in Italy. When did he go in? Uh, had to be forty-two. Yeah, after he got out of high school, mm -hmm. and uh, he didn't. He never talked about it, as so many of the men didn't. But uh, he did say one time that he uh, came across some dead Germans, and, and he, he did take a Luger off one of the, a German Luger gun off one of the dead fellows. And also a time when he got knocked off his, his uh, half-track vehicle by a tree branch. That seemed to be it. He, he, he had a hard time forgetting that. I don't know whether he landed on his head or what, but he had. And I know that he shot and got, was shot at. But, uh, How was your sister affected by the war? Did she have a sweetheart who was in the service? Well, she sure did. She had her college sweetheart, a man named, her name was Helen, and his name was John Grant, and uh, he was in the medical corps. He was an officer in the medical corps. Captain. A captain. And he was wounded mm -hmm. in the foot and was sent back to the hospital in Chicago. And that was the end of his end of his tour after, you know, and when he recovered from that, he he was discharged, I'm sure, mm -hmm. shortly after that. Do you know where he was when that happened? You know, I don't. Mm. I really don't. If I heard, I, I'd forgotten. <laughs> and they married? Yes, married in 1941. Mm -hmm. And your brother, mm -hmm. was he wounded, ever wounded? No, not my brother. Can we uh, go back and think a little bit about uh, some of the significant things that happened when you were growing up? Do you, for example, do you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard that the war had started in Europe? And what did you think about that? Do you do you remember about that? And and what can you tell us about that? Well, <laughs> we certainly remember Pearl Harbor because it was a Sunday. And when the next day, when we went into school, everybody was talking about Pearl Harbor. And uh, President Roosevelt had been on the radio. And everybody was grouped around the radio. Of course, there was no TV or anything in those days. Um, the news came, and in our history class, we were, you know, were talking about it and very shocked about Pearl Harbor. 
Well, simply that we were just uh, drawn into it because of the way Germany was moving, and we, we feared for our safety, so... But it really didn't seem significant before Pearl Harbor? Was, do you remember the talk prior to? Well, my uncles, uh, my Uncle Bill, my Uncle Lyle, and Uncle Charlie, when they were in the war, and uh, Uncle Bill was over in Germany, he was with the engineers. They built the bridges. They went ahead of the troops and built the bridges. And he um, married, um, brought back a war bride from Wales. And she was in the Women's Army Corps in Wales, and, uh, British. And he brought her back. And they lived for many years, neighbors, and had children, the ages of our children. And did they talk about what was happening, really, or did they not share that? No, they really, people that were really in the war didn't talk about it much. You know, if they saw horrible things and that, they kind of wanted to forget it. We didn't hear a lot of war stories. My dad and his dad were never in the war, World War I, because they were only like 14 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. So they missed out being in, in the war. But my brother um, was a pharmacist mate in the Navy, and he went into the Navy shortly after his graduation in 1944, and then um, and he served on the, a ship, the Pierce, and he was at Wake Island, and he was at several places of battles. But he came back and went to the University of Michigan, graduated from the pharmacy school, and um, eventually was a partner in the drugstore that he had worked in in high school. But Roger always worked in the clothing store, and the first time we, we started to date, I walked downtown with a bunch of girls after school one time, and we went into Hayward's menswear, and we asked if Roger Kitten was there, and um, the owner said, he's downstairs. And so we went down, and here he was at a little treadle sewing machine putting hems in trousers. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the wartime, we, none, everything was rationed. So gas, we, we seldom ever dated in cars. Everybody walked. Every place we went, we walked. And he lived a couple miles from my house, and he would walk up to get me. Then we'd walk a mile to town go to a movie and then we'd walk another mile down to the ice cream parlor and then back home again and he figured he probably walked about seven or eight miles every time we had a date. Way to get in shape. Yeah. But it was wonderful. I mean it was fun. We, wor we worked on Friday nights because well in the wartime when the bomber plant came to Ypsilanti they made the B-24s and all the older girls, even the girls who were maybe seniors in high school, um, quit school and went out to work in the bomber plant. And so that left all the other stores like the dime store and waitressing in the restaurants and working in the telephone company and those kinds of jobs to us younger girls. And we started working when we were only 13 or 14 years old because the war was on. And um, we had thousands of new people here in Ypsilanti. So during school hours? No, no, okay. always part-time. We would work after school from 4 to 8, and then on Saturday we would work from 8 to 12 and 4 to 8. But after school, I, one of my first jobs was in the 10 cent store, and Kresge's, Kresge's 5 and 10. And we'd go down after school, work from 3.30 until closing time, which was usually 5.30, and then all day Saturday. And Roger was just down the street in the same block as where I worked. So on Friday nights when the stores all stayed open till 9 o'clock, then he would come and pick me up and we would walk home in the snow or rain or whatever was going on, you know. And, and all, of my, all of my girlfriends worked downtown and all of his boyfriends, the young teenage boys, uh, worked in all the stores, the drug stores, the uh, hardware stores. Um, the clothing stores, the shoe stores. And Ypsilanti was a boom town at that time. Mm -hmm. 
lots of activity. Do you remember any of the uh, civilian efforts that contributed to the to the uh, wartime effort? Uh, things like scrap drives and uh, can you tell us a little bit about those kinds of things? Well, her class, or my class, of course, was first to start that thing, and we had uh, freight cr cars sitting down on the siding at, at the depot, and we would go out and collect uh, paper, you know, newspapers, and uh, that, that was one, we did that in, separate from the, uh, from the metal drive and scrap drive, mm -hmm. but we would fill cars full. How did how did you transport that around? How how did you gather that up? Did you did, did everybody have a car or did you? It, it all it all came together by very all all kinds of means. We'd stack it at the school and then uh, load it on on trucks. I don't. Well, my dad was at the lumber company, and so the lumber they loaned the lumber trucks to pick up stuff. Uh, my classmate Punk Works uh, family owned Peninsula Paper Company. And so they had big trucks, and they loaded up. So anybody that was in any business that had a truck, but the schoolyard was was 30 feet high with scrap paper and uh, scrap metal on our drives. We also had war bond drives, and we'd have contests, and everybody bought war bonds, savings bonds. Mm -hmm. And you would get your parents to buy savings bonds, and everybody bought savings bonds. And in my Girl Scout troop, we rolled bandages for the Red Cross, and we uh, knitted um, little squares for Afghans. And everybody was was in the war effort by some hook or crook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about things like civilian defense efforts? Where were there was there any concern that uh, maybe uh, enemy bombers would fly over and? and bomb some of the heavy industry that occurs in this area. Lois had that firsthand at her house because her dad was a uh, air, air raid warden. Mm. And of course they'd go around and see that every curtain was down, there was no light showing. There would be certain times that they would announce there was going to be an, uh, an, uh, an air raid drill. And then uh, the air raid wardens on each block, they had a white hard hat and a flashlight with a red thing around the light so that the light wouldn't show. Everybody had to pull down their shades while the air raid wardens ins walked around their block to inspect to make sure there was no light coming through. That was in case of an air raid. Of course we never did have an air raid but it was something that everybody was trained for. Mm -hmm. Were there any other efforts of that type that you remember, or was that kind of the main thing that you remember about civilian defense? The ladies made bandages mm -hmm. at the church. Mm -hmm. The uh, Red Cross had a van, Mrs. Clary uh, drove the Red Cross van. Uh, the, the, um, a lot of the women went to work at the bomber plant. Our superintendent's wife and our principal of our school went to work at the bomber plant. Lots of mothers went to work, and before then, no mothers ever worked, you know, unless they were widows or something. But, um, so there was that effort. And um, the um, thrift shop was started at that time, the Ypsilanti Thrift Shop, which I am a member of today. But 60 years ago, they started uh, the um, uh, ladies of the church and the, the uh, bridge club wives and the doctors and lawyers wives, they started an auxiliary and um, they um, would have these bundle teas at the country club and everybody would buy uh, bring a bundle of clothing that they had and uh, come to the tea and then they had a, a little shop downtown, just a one storefront and they distributed clothing to these families that came in with children that didn't have things to wear. They gave, they gave clothes, and uh, maybe they later sold them for 10 cents, 25 cents, or something like that. But they were very um, instrumental in helping to clothe the poor families that had come from all over the country to work in the plant. 
um, there was a whole village uh, started. It was called Willow Run Village, mm -hmm. and it was out west of town. And these little shacks, like, were built, little one-room uh, wood places. They had pot-bellied stoves, and they had um, they had didn't have refrigerators. They had ice boxes that um, the Marsh Ice Company regularly delivered a chunk of ice for the ice boxes. And there were hundreds of those units out in Willow Run that these families lived in. But they started schools out there, and um, they eventually had a community building, and they even had a theater out there. And to this day, Willow Run has a wonderful high school, and there are permanent homes built after the war. Those, well, right after the war, those little wooden places that they lived were turned over to the University of Michigan for married housing. And uh, uh, some of our friends that were newlyweds after the war lived out there in uh, Willow Run Village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lois and Roger, um, we are aware that you had kind of a significant adventure during the time that uh, Roger was in the service, especially when he was stationed out in Colorado. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about the cross-country automobile trip that uh, uh, that you took uh, to go out and visit him with, with your parents and his parents? Mm -hmm. This was right after my graduation from high school in 1945, and my little brother was, I think, five years old. And my folks and Roger's folks and my little brother and I headed out in an old, well, 1940, um, Hudson. Hudson car and we traveled all the way across the country to Denver Colorado and we stayed in um, motels along the way and one one night mother started screaming in this motel and there was a mouse nest down in the mattress <laughs> and she wanted to get out of there in a hurry and so we moved out about four o'clock in the morning and headed on our way well, when we got out to Denver, of course, we saw him, and a, there was a wonderful place where we went to dance. It was called Elix Gardens. Elix Gardens. Yeah. There was a, an amusement park out there, and of course, um, at Easter time, we weren't there at Easter time, but they could go up in the mountains uh, for sunrise service. It was a beautiful place. How long did and, you stay? Well, we stayed maybe a week or two there, but our whole trip. On the way back, we got stranded in Belvedere, South Dakota, because the car broke down. And this place had about 100 people in the town, and 50 of them were Indians. And so there wasn't really any place to stay, but somebody had an empty room that they rented to us, you know. And so Mother and Dad had a room, and we, Billy and I had a room, and his folks had a room. And we were stranded there for 21 days. Uh -oh. And they had to take the car apart and send for a part in Chicago. So we were stranded in this little one-horse town. But we got acquainted with the people, and we even were invited to a wedding while we were there. And it was a little, funny little church. And the bride and groom, the bride walked down the aisle. And as she pulled up her gown so she wouldn't trip over it, she had a pair of tennis shoes, the kind that came up over your ankle and had the circle on it, and she had these um, under her bridal gown, these tennis shoes. But um, my little brother started school there because it was the end of the, uh, it was in the end of August. And so Billy went to kindergarten during the time he was there. And then when I c came home, I started in uh, the last of September at Eastern Michigan University at university as a freshman. So that was quite an exciting time. What did you study? Uh, it, was it was it still Michigan State Normal College at that Michigan time? Michigan State Normal College. And um, all of my girlfriends were there at the same time, and our guys were still in service. Uh, but some of them, you know, began to be discharged and come back. And basically what we took was um, not just a special course. We knew that we were going to all be married as soon as our guys got back. And so we took things like household mechanics and, well, we took English and history and 
uh, public speaking, public speaking, and things like that. But we also learned how to make a doorbell, and we cut a tin can out to make a sugar scoop. And to this day, I still have that sugar scoop. And um, so it was kind of a pre-marriage <laughs> courses. Home economics. Yeah, home economics. How to how to uh, manage a um, uh, household and stuff. And then when when our boyfriends all came back. Um, one by one, we started getting married, and uh, we were the very, well, we were the second couple to be married, but we went on our honeymoon, and two weeks later, we came back for another girlfriend's wedding, and every two weeks, there would be another one of my girlfriends who got married, and we had a large group of girls because we were in the drum and, the girls' drum and bugle corps which was the pride of Ypsilanti for 43 years. The churches were busy enough so that we had to be married on Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah. So what was this bugle? I'm sorry. Well, the Drum and Bugle Corps was a chosen organization. It was like an, an honor society. They chose the girls to um, be in it, and you had to be a certain height and a certain weight because all the, the uniforms were the same. And they were the um, Scottish uniforms with the Brody plaid skirts the white um, wool jackets and the brass buttons and the red epaulets and they were beautiful, beautiful uniforms. Um, they were they were several hundred dollars a piece, and uh, the service clubs in Ypsilanti, like the Kiwanis and the Rotary and the different uh, groups, sponsored a uniform, and that's how they bought the uniforms. And it started in 1935, and once you were chosen to be in it. Then um, they taught you to march and to play the b drums and the bugles. And I was in it for four years, and I was the first one in the first row, and I played the tenor drum, the one where you twirl the sticks. And then later, 30, well, 25, 30 years later, 30 years later, I guess, our daughter was in the drum and bugle mm -hmm. corps, and my niece and my sister and whole generations of girls were in the core, And it was the most prestigious thing that any young girl could be in. And we led every parade in Ypsilanti during the time we were in the core. And we marched at the football games, and we marched at homecoming, and every, you know, clean up, paint up, fix up, fix up week, and Christmas parade, and Thanksgiving parade. We marched in, um, University of Michigan football field for the first time an all-girl organization had ever marched there and at the time we formed a B-24 bomber and wow. we marched down the field the, this plane marched down the field and our um, majorette was the propeller and we even had some little smoke coming out of the back of the airplane but that was quite an experience also marched in the um, J.L. Hudson uh, Thanksgiving Parade in Detroit. Um, we, the American Legion sponsored us to go to their convention in Grand Rapids and also Chicago. So it was a real... The Detroit Lions game. The Detroit Lions uh, game, football game, which was on Sundays. So it was really a wonderful organization. Very prestigious. And was this during high school? During high school. You, okay. you were chosen in the ninth grade and then you um, were taught the instruments and you were active in the 10th and 11th and 12th. But because one of the girls um, in Roger's class had moved to California when her mother died, uh, she left the space uh, for this tenor drum. And because I was in the orchestra at the time and the leader of the orchestra happened to be the leader of the drum and bugle corps, he asked me if I would take her place, mm -hmm. and so I was the only girl in my class to be in the corps for four years, and that was really a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And so back to when you were, when you got married, where did you go on your honeymoon? We went to up to a, a little lake up northern Michigan mm -hmm. called Fife Lake, and uh, spent some quiet time up there. We went out and got sunburned on the lake, <laughs> which was not, well, the, not the thing to do. On the way up there, after our wedding, we stopped at Lowell, Michigan, and saw one of the boys that was in the Air Corps with him. 
and we visited there, he and his girlfriend, and we stayed all night at her house, and we had a day with them. We went up to the uh, Michigan Capitol at Lansing, and we went through the Capitol. So we did some sightseeing on the way up, and then we got to the cottage. It was owned by the people, actually, that lived in this house at the time, because I lived next door, and I babysat their children. They, they had three children. So um, we rented their cottage for a week, and we actually were on a two-week honeymoon. Mm. But then we came back, and we still didn't have a place to live, so that was when we lived to every relative that went on vacation. We lived in their house until our little house was built in the country about a year later. Do you remember about what was the, what was the month when it was finished and, and what year? Yeah, our little house was, we moved in on Aunt Monica's birthday on August 14th of 1948. And it was a little, we called it our dollhouse because it had, it was on a third of an acre in a little apple orchard at, at my grandparents' farm. And um, it uh, had a living room with a fireplace and a little kitchen, two little bedrooms and a bath. It did, luckily, it did have a basement, which we, eventually finished off into a playroom because we had four children while we lived there. But it was a darling little house and uh, we loved it and had lots of apple trees. The, our little boys had tree huts in the tree, the mm -hmm. apple trees that they could climb in. Uh, we had a swing, uh, a rope swing with a tire on it that, uh, mm -hmm. we, that the kids could play in in the yard. And we had a little wading pool and actually it was just a, a real fun little place, but we outgrew it. We literally outgrew it. And so then, the person that lived in this house, he was an attorney, and they were going to, their children were grown uh, by then, and out of the house, and they were going to move, and so they called up and they said, would you like to buy our house? We're going to move over to a few blocks away. Well, at that time, we had four little children and not much money and hardly any furniture, and we thought, how can we go from this little four-room house into this nine-room house? But his folks and my folks scrounged around in their basement and attic and found some lamps and end tables, and the lady of the house left a few things, um, the curtains and the carpeting and the, oh, the dining room set. Mm -hmm. They had um, so, sold that to us, and uh, so we did manage to uh, get into this house, and we've been here since 1958. Eight. Mm -hmm. yeah. and how about your first vehicle, your first automobile? I don't know how we dated in that coupe. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was my, br that was my brother's no. coupe that we dated in. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, he was, when he left for service, and we were still here, marking time to ourselves waiting to go in. He had a cute little blue 36 Ford coupe with a rumble seat. Rumble seat. So you think we didn't uh, have fun in that, having a double dates, you know, and everything. The other couple riding in the rumble seat. Can you tell us a little bit about what a date was like in that period of time during the war? Almost always movies. I the movies. Movie yeah. Then went and got an ice cream soda. Yeah, and maybe sunny. even go to Ann Arbor for our ice cream soda. Only if, only at our J-Hop and our senior prom, senior farewell, the formal parties, did anybody go in cars. And because the gas was rationed, two or three guys would get together and pitch in 15 cents or so, because gas was maybe 15 cents a gallon, 20 cents. And we'd go triple date, and um, we would go to the ballroom of Ch Charles McKinney Hall, which was right over the back fence at Eastern Michigan University. And then afterwards, we'd go over to Ann Arbor to Drake's Sandwich Shop or the Sugar Bowl. It was a place called the Sugar Bowl. And that was a pretty nice place and a lot of the people. But other than that, they were, that was about the only times that we... Did you ever go for there. ice cream or anything like that in Ypsilanti? We walked after the movie at the Martha Washington Theater, which was right next door to the store that he worked in. Mm -hmm. We would walk down on um, Michigan, Avenue. And Michigan Avenue and the Miller Street Dairy Store. Miller, Miller's Ice Cream Parlor. Do you mm -hmm. remember that, Rick? Miller's? Absolutely. Yes. 
and we would get uh, sodas were 10 cents, uh, hot fudge sundaes were 15, and malteds were probably 15, and that's where everybody would go. That was a hangout. We had another hangout. It was called Mikus, and um, or Mikus, Mikus or Gaudis, and they were Mikus was a candy store, mm -hmm. and they made homemade candies, but they had a soda fountain and. And they had booths, and you could go in there and get a coat. So we're talking downtown Ypsilanti now. Downtown mm -hmm. Ypsilanti. So everybody dated in downtown Ypsilanti because there wasn't any place to go. You know, we would double date, triple date, and on um, um, we we danced a lot in each other's homes. Mm -hmm. We would go. We all lived in big houses. There weren't any track houses built or the smaller houses like after the war. Mm -hmm. We all lived in big houses and we would, um, every Friday night we had what we called a hen party and about 21 girls, all of us in the drum and bugle corps and in the scout troop, we would go stay all night at somebody's house and we'd have so much fun. We'd give each other oatmeal facials and we'd roll each other's hair up on curlers mm -hmm. and we would just have the best time and maybe we'd uh, go to bed in night shirts or something, you know, mm -hmm. crazy like that. But about every Friday night, we were at somebody's, after the dime dances, because the football games and all of our basketball games and stuff was on Friday night, mm -hmm. and then there was a dime dance afterwards. And so, of course, we always were at the dime dance, and then we would go to our girlfriend's house to, uh... Now, one of our girlfriends was Mary Lee Tucker, who, whose dad was Preston Tucker, who invented the Tucker torpedo car. Mm -hmm. And Mary Lee lived in a great big house, and we really had fun down there. It had lots of rooms, and her telephone had a 50-foot cord, and we dragged <laughs> the phone all over the house, you know, and, and uh, tell stories, and usually the guys would come by. They knew where the girls were, you know, and they'd holler outside. And, you know, they'd holler outside. No. <laughs> do, you, do you ever have reunions? Oh, did, all did the time. Still. We, well, he has his 60th class reunion this year. Oh, great. And next year is mine. And a person in my class called Punk Quirk and I have been chairman of the, of our class reunions for 11 times. Wow. Every five years we've had a class reunion. And the whole gang gets together, and we have so much fun. Mm -hmm. Usually, we house three other couples here in our home. So when somebody writes that they're coming from California or Florida or New York or wherever, the classmates here in Ypsilanti will call them up or write a little note and say, "Will you? We have guest rooms at our house, and would you be our mm -hmm. guest?" So the last reunion, we had a couple from Florida one from Louisville, Kentucky, and one from Dayton, Ohio. And each year we um, house classmates in our home, and it's usually a weekend affair. Mm -hmm. And so Friday, Saturday, and, and uh, Sunday. So this year is his, and there he has a class meeting next week. <clears throat> We've had these reunions every five years also. Mm -hmm. It's been a parallel situation. The class mm -hmm. of 1944 and the class of 1945. Yeah. Of course, we're far the more superior class. <laughs> well, a lot of the handsome young men in the class of 1944 and the most married, beautiful women in the class married of the girls in 1945. Really? That's the way it worked out. So a lot know. of his boyfriends married my girlfriends, and nice. we always were in a big bunch together. So we had a wonderful, happy life. Do you think that the times that you grew up in, uh, particularly growing growing up during the war, do you think that that contributed to the fact that you've remained so close over the years and have remained such good friends, or do you think you would have been anyway? I think it had to do with the size of the classes. We didn't have any of the three and four hundred student classes no. like they have in some of the big schools today. It, it, it's You can get closer when you have a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your school experience a little bit uh, down at at the uh, at the old high school. Well, it's hard to know where to where to begin with school experience, but of course. How about in kindergarten? Well, same kindergarten was uh, the at, same teacher. At, <laughs> at the same kindergarten that where Lois went at Ipsy High School. All in the same building. Yeah, we lived wow. on. Starting we lived on this side of the city, and uh, we went there 
in kindergarten and in first grade, in part of the second grade, and then my folks moved to the east side of town, and we and I went to Prospect School. And he was student right. council there, president, and then when and he library. Came, <laughs> when he came to Ipsy High, he was student council president again at Ipsy High. But I started kindergarten in that building and went the whole 13 grades in the same building. It was a large three story school, which is it's still here. Mm -hmm. In fact, now it's been made into senior apartments. It has 105 apartments in the old Ipsy High, and it was a beautiful school. And um, we just had a great, great time in school. Wonderful school experience. And we went to the same church. Both of our families grew up in the same church, so we actually knew each other. We knew each other's name because we were you know, three, four years old and in Sunday school, but um, I, you know, I didn't really, he didn't pay any attention to me. How do you know? <laughs> he was in the class with my brother who was a year older, so I knew what his name was. Our mothers were in the Woman's Society, uh, the Ladies' Aid in church many years together. In fact, when we began dating and all the time we've been married, his folks and my folks were best friends and they would vacation together. My folks lived right next door and his folks lived two blocks away, right on the street behind us. So we have all been, practically all our life, good friends. It's been a wonderful trip. Yes, it has. And getting to school, did your parents drive you? No, we Never. walked to school. Walk. And we came home at noon for lunch, so we walked a mile down to school in the morning, and we always had drum and bugle corps early in the morning. We'd go down about 7.30 and we'd have drum and bugle practice. And then uh, come home at noon, and we had an hour and a half at noon. Everybody went home to lunch and everybody walked back, and then school was out at 3.30. And then, of course, the football team, the basketball team, the swimming team, the tumbling and all of the girls athletic club and the boys sports were after school and then they all took place on Friday night so every Friday night there was either football basketball swimming meets and different things you know like that um, so primarily the student body was was city folks not really the the farming no. Or country. No, there were Some no, came in from the Well, but there weren't buses. The we didn't have any buses at that time. They had to find their way in. They had to have to get their own way in. And sometimes if they lived out in the country, uh, they would um, maybe had a, have a neighbor or somebody. They'd pick up mm -hmm. a neighbor. And uh, I know a friend of in my class had a station wagon, and his family lived about three miles west of town, and they sold, had an antique store, Schmidt's Antiques. And so Joe would pick up another classmate on the corner and two other girls that lived down the road and bring them into school. They were the only ones that ever stayed at noon. There was a lunchroom in school, but it was only for the people that lived out in the country that would brought a sack lunch. Mm -hmm. And everybody else walked home and came back again. So it was a, a fun time. Did you by chance know an Iver Schmidt? Iver Schmidt, oh yes, yeah. that was Joe's brother. Mm -hmm. Joe was in my class. Do you know Iver? Yes, I know he's passed away. He passed away. Just yes. recently. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah. It's, it's, I know he was a decorated, actually, a decorated Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. Lost a leg. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Joe was passed, too. And his sister, well, I guess she's still living here. No, sister. But anyhow. We sure had fun. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing your uh, experiences with us. Um, I think we're going to uh, pause a little bit now so that we can look at some of the uh, some of the items that you'd like to uh, that you had gathered together to to show us and to record on tape. So uh, we'll pause a minute and then we'll come back and take a look at uh, some of the pictures and. Uh, things that you've, uh, you've saved from over the years that helped to tell this story. Oh, yeah, they were yeah, all. it wasn't like, you didn't take colored pictures, they turned out all black and white and then, hmm. I see. This is a story of the Gilbert Mansion in Ypsilanti, which was the teen canteen when we were kids. 
1943, on September 8th, on my birthday, uh, I had a date. I went up there to dance, and Roger had was uh, had a date with another girl. But it was a custom uh, that on somebody's birthday, all the guys took turns dancing with the birthday girl. And when it was his turn to dance with me, he was such a good dancer, and he was handsome, and he had nice clothes, and I thought, oh, oh. boy, you know, this is really, really something. But I thought, uh, you know, we both went home with our respective dates, and prospective date, respective dates, and about a week later, I was babysitting, and the phone rang, and he said, this is Roger Caton, and I wonder if you will go to the show with me on Saturday night. Well, I just about flipped because I never thought that the most handsome boy in school, the president of the student council, the announcer for the football games, and the lead in the senior play, the big man on campus, would ever look twice at me. But that's uh, where we first went danced. After that first date, we were a steady couple from then on. And in 1944, in February, at the J-Hop, uh, this is our dance picture, and at that time we didn't realize, it was wartime, but we didn't realize that very soon he would be going into service. So this was one of our, our pictures. Somebody from the, a representative from the Air Force Reserves came to Ypsilanti High School in early February of 1944 to tell the young men there about um, getting into the uh, Army Specialized Reserve Officers Training Program. And um, after that, uh, Roger was interested, and he asked his, uh, he needed some references, so Norris G. Wiltsey, the principal of our high school, wrote this uh, reference um, uh, concerning Roger. Uh, Roger got his orders to uh, go up to the Army Specialized uh, Reserve Officers Training Program in um, early June. And um, so the day before, well, he was to uh, report up there on June 6th, 1944, which meant that he was going to miss his senior picnic, his senior class night, the senior prom, and also his graduation, which happened to be June 17th of 1944. So we weren't, I was kind of sad about that, of course, but the day before he left on June 6th, we went to Whitmore Lake uh, with our families, my folks and his folks and my little brother, and we had a, a picnic and went swimming at Whitmore Lake. And this is a picture of us the day before he left. Early in the morning of June 6, 1944, the young cadets uh, were arrived by bus in at Houghton, Michigan, at the uh, College of Mining and Technology, where they were to receive their training. And this is a picture of um, of the uh, college up at Houghton. Uh, when they arrived there, they found they discovered it was D-Day. When they arrived up at Houghton, uh, the first thing, they got their uniforms, they got their assignments into their dormitories and things, and uh, this picture was um, taken just uh, five days later on uh, Sunday, June 11th, and they are at the Methodist Church in Houghton, Michigan, and this is Roger. So you can see the young men were very Christian young men. On June 12th of 1944, just six days after Roger left, this letter was sent to him from his class advisor, Miss Mary Parrish, and all the kids called her Ma. And, the, and his classmates were having exams, but Ma sent around a couple of sheets of paper and she said, I want all of you to write a little note to Roger. They really missed him in class. They missed his, his exams. This is a page of some of the notes that his classmates sent to him from Ma Parrish's class. There are four pages all together, and they're just very nice notes telling how much they missed Roger. This is the senior class advisor, Miss Mary E. Parrish. They all called her Ma, and they loved her. She was very special. 
This picture was taken September 8, 1944, and it was my birthday, and he was home on leave, and this was taken out in front of the carriage house at his folks' house. Um, just a few days later, uh, after he went back, I sent him this little card, Somebody Misses You. This is just a sample of one of the letters um, that he got while he was at Houghton. I wrote a letter to him every single day, and in our attic we have a big suitcase full of all the letters that he received while he was in service. This uh, was taken in uh, winter of 1944 in his winter uniform. He was home on leave. It was probably Christmas time. This is the little blue coupe that we dated in sometimes when we could get a gallon of gas and it had a rumble seat that our friends went in. This is his um, uh, one of my favorite pictures. In April of 1945 um, the young men from were transferred from uh, Houghton to Shepherd Field, Texas and there they took uh, basic training two times because the war was winding down at that time. They had had tests to see what they qualified for in the Air Force, but then they never really got to use them. This was the very first letter he received from me while he was in uh, Shepherd Field, Texas. All the time that he was gone, this was his picture that I saved on my in my bedroom at home, and it said, All My Love, Rod. That was his nickname, Rod. This was my picture that he had a smaller copy of it, but this was the picture that he had to uh, remember me when all those months that he was gone. This is a formal picture when we were in college um, at Eastern at Michigan State Normal College, which is now Eastern Michigan University. Um, Roger was um, out of service at that time after the war, and this is me. This is my best friend Elaine Power, and her boyfriend Roger Kelly was my Roger's best friend and he was still in the service. Although I received my engagement ring on Christmas Eve in 1945, we were not married until July of 1947 because there was no places to live. We had so many people in Ypsilanti and so um, he lived at his folks house which was two blocks away from my folks house and every Sunday he came home for dinner at our house. He came over to my house for dinner, my home-cooked meal. Um, w this is our wedding picture in 1947. Cutting the cake and my bride dress. This is a picture of our wedding party. It was in July, so it was uh, summer, and it was an all-white wedding. I had uh, my sister was my maid of honor, and my little cousin was the uh, flower girl. And then the four girls are my best friends, and uh, that was our wedding party. And all of the, um, the, the boys were Roger's best friends, or his brother and my brother. Uh, this is uh, the yearbook for 1944, uh, Roger's yearbook. Um, he, um, we have class reunions every five years. We've had, uh, he's, he has had uh, 11 class reunions and his 12th one for his 60th class reunion comes up next month. And notice that uh, the cover of the yearbook is designed with a V for victory in 1944. This is a page from Roger's yearbook, and it show it's a V, uh, V for victory, and all of the boys here were drafted before their senior year, and uh, this is in honor of the boys in service already. This is a picture of Roger's classmates out in front of Ypsilanti High School, and it says, Buy War Bonds. We had big bond drives and uh, sold a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of bonds for $7,000 was the grand total for the senior class. I'm sorry, Lou, is that, is that right? I, I thought their goal was $44,000 and they raised $57,000. Oh, I said, yeah, uh, back that up. Okay. <laughs> back that up. No, it's okay. We can, we can just make a correction. Okay. <laughs> 
See, I was reading this and I thought it said, I thought that was the dollar sign. It's 57 instead of 7,000. This is a conclusion for our uh, presentation of the pictures of Roger and Lois. Uh, this is from the front page of the high school yearbook from 1945. This is Lois's senior yearbook and it ends with a salute to the 1945 boys in service. And here is the cover of the yearbook, Trials of 45.